Mississippi Farm Bureau. Greg Gaston joins us, co-host of Sports 56 Middays on Sports 56 WHBQ in Memphis. And he is the sideline reporter on the Memphis Tigers football radio network. Greg, great to see you a couple of weeks ago and good to talk to you today. What's up, my man? Absolutely, Richard. Great to run into you and thanks for having me on your show. So let's talk about this past Saturday night. We saw Memphis in the opener uh, against Nichols, and that was the debut for Seth Hennigan last week. A little bit different type of game. They had to kind of hang on in a, in a shootout against Arkansas State. What did you take away from Memphis's win over Arkansas State on the road? Yeah, I didn't expect uh, that type of, of output by both teams. Memphis is a pretty good offense, Richard, but defensively we – talked a lot about their improvement in the offseason with Mike McIntyre now having that full year to be able to work with these guys, spring football, which they missed the year prior because of COVID. Uh, we expected a lot more, and uh, Arkansas State in that second half it exposed them pretty good. I, I still think they're better than what they showed, but for some reason when they made the switch, when Butch Jones decided to take out Lane Hatcher and bring in James Blackman, the Tigers just had problems in defending, he was just standing back there and heaving at 50, 60 yards, and they were completing passes. And all of a sudden, it's coming down to the final seconds and a Hail Mary that just went awry for Arkansas State. So the Tigers, uh, I think, just survival mode to, to get out of Jonesboro with the win. Look, they stepped up in competition from Nichols, but they really got to step up in competition this Saturday when Mississippi State comes to Memphis. You've seen Seth Hennigan play quarterback now two games, and there was all this mystery surrounding who was going to start. Turns out internally there wasn't that much mystery because of the injury uh, that that the other quarterback was dealing with. So what what do you make of the play of the true freshman from Denton, Texas, after a couple of weeks? Well, I've been incredibly impressed. I mean, this may be one of those Wally Pipp situations. I know you know what I'm talking about. Hopefully your listeners do yeah. as well when all of a sudden Lou Gehrig took over at first base for the Yankees when Wally Pitt was out of the lineup, and, and he never relinquished it after grabbing the job. Gannell injury, Seth Hennigan, who was really good in the spring, and he's been here since January, steps up, gives him a battle, and now he has the job because of the injury to Gannell. And I call him Mr. Cool. I am just shocked at how calm, cool, and collected he is back there in the pocket. You called that first game, and there wasn't a lot of pressure on Hennigan. But against Arkansas State, they got to him a few times. They sacked him four times, got up, brushed himself off, and came back and made a great pass. His accuracy is tremendous. He hits guys in stride, and I'm extremely impressed what he's bringing to the table. Greg, price of poker goes up this week, though, with uh, with Mississippi State <laughs> coming into town. Uh, did not play very well in their opener against Louisiana Tech, but able to come back and get the win with 20 points in the fourth quarter. Pretty dominant uh, against an NC State team that uh, that looked good in its opener against USF. W when you look at this matchup, do, do you start out in terms of things that you circle or might be areas of concern for Memphis and looking at Mississippi State's offense or its defense? Well, you would normally go in there thinking offense because of what Will Rogers can do and they can score points, and, and that's certainly a concern. But when you hold NC State to 10, and I know NC State's not an offensive juggernaut, but that's a, that's a pretty good defensive effort. So that concerns me, that line of scrimmage battle on both sides for, for Memphis. Will they be able to open up the holes for Brandon Thomas, who did an outstanding job once he broke that, that first line of containment? He was gone against Arkansas State. Will they have that type of success in the trenches against Mississippi State? And then on the other side, are they going to be able to get the Will Rogers? Are they going to be able to put some pressure on him? They were able to do that in the first half against Lane Hatcher. They would get pressure on him. But as I said earlier in the second half, they weren't able to do that with Blackman. So the line of scrimmage, which is a, a big part of every game when you're analyzing, is certainly going to be pivotal for Memphis uh, to be able to win this game against Mississippi State. What is the best position group? on the offensive side for Memphis? I would say the best position group is probably the wide receivers. Even though they lost okay. some talent from last year, Tosh Washington transferred, ends up at USC. They got some really good young players that are stepping up. Uh, Javon Ivory being one of them who had a good game in that Nichols game, as you know. But Gabe Rogers, they moved him from the secondary to receiver to go along with their stud, Calvin Austin. He's a little guy, but he is a, he's a track star. He's got that breakaway speed. And I throw in 
the fact they have a really capable tight end and Sean Dykes was great hands, had a big game against Arkansas State. It's hard to say it's the, it's the running backs right now, although they're off to a great start this year. But coming into this season, that was a question mark. There was the question mark at quarterback. And with the offensive line, they're a little bit deeper than they've been, but they still have a couple of decisions that Ryan Silverfield has to ultimately make uh, with a couple of those offensive linemen, because if you look at the depth chart, he has two oars going into game three. So they're still not decided on starters, but I think there's a little more depth with that O-line. Greg, when you, you mentioned Calvin Austin the third, and, and he's just an incredible playmaker. But you also pointed out the size. What is he, 5'6", maybe 5'7"? No, he can fly. How does he match up with the cornerback group for Mississippi State, where you've got – uh, Emmanuel Forbes. Hey, Dad, what's it? I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Martin Emerson. Martin Emerson is the other. So bigger, physical, all SEC caliber corners. Can Calvin Austin kind of do his thing, or are those guys able to neutralize him? I don't want to doubt Calvin Austin. He's been absolutely incredible. They list him at 5'9", but you're probably right. Or 5'7", or 5'6". Uh, he has that blazing breakaway speed. But I'm surprised Arkansas State didn't double him up. I think Mississippi State, with their physicality, they'll probably come up and they'll chuck him within those five yards and then have somebody back there as well to double him. You, you have to, if you're a defense, and any of the opponents this year against Memphis this year need to certainly strategize to try to take Calvin out of the game. If you take Calvin out of the game, then you're putting a lot more pressure on the young wide receivers, guys I just mentioned like Javon Ivory, Gabriel Rogers. Eddie Lewis. So that's, I think, uh, somewhere where it's going to be certainly concerned for the Tigers to get Austin open when I believe Mississippi State will try to be real physical with a blazer but a lot smaller guy. Greg, what kind of a crowd are you expecting on Saturday? And I know that's always kind of a question when you're talking about Memphis games. At times these crowds have shown up nicely in, in some bigger games, and at times it kind of leaves you scratching your head a little bit. With an SEC team coming in, you would assume that Mississippi State will bring a, a decent crowd as well. What does this number look like? I think the number will be around 40. Uh, they're, oh, I know they're well over 30 right now. Mississippi State, like you said, Richard, they're definitely going to bring people. Uh, hopefully they'll leave those cowbells home, but we'll, we'll see what happens there. As far as the <laughs> Tigers fans, they will certainly come to the game. As long as the weather's nice and the weather's expected to be nice, I know it'll be hot out there, but it's a 3 o'clock game, so it doesn't really affect maybe your evening plans or your morning plans. I expect now that the fans have seen the Tigers play a couple of games, they're excited. It's not often you get an SEC team in Memphis. The, the last time, I think, maybe in the old Miss game, and it certainly had a great crowd for that. So I would expect, I would be disappointed with the combination of Tigers fans and Mississippi State fans if it's not 40. All right. Greg, last thing, and, and kind of switching away from the game, the uh, the news of the, the four teams from, or three teams from the American plus BYU making the transition to the uh, Big 12. We saw Cincinnati running onto the field with the Big 12 flag. We know that that's something that, that Memphis would love to be a part of, and you got the story that maybe the Big 12 isn't done in terms of expansion yet. What are you hearing at this point as it pertains to Memphis and possible conference realignment? Well, let me say this, first of all. Obviously, it's, it's hugely disappointing. It's not the first time. Memphis has been there, unfortunately, a number of times. I think they're absolutely in the best position they've ever been. I think sometimes it has to do with perception of the city, which is unfortunate. This is a great town, and I've been here now 26 years. I think the football program over the last seven, eight years has proven what they can do. And in a power conference, I think they can do a lot more. This is a, a rich area of recruiting. Uh, football, you've seen a lot of players go to SEC teams. Well, maybe a lot of them would stay if Memphis was part of a Power 5 conference. Basketball, of course, is hugely popular. And with Penny Hardaway and what he's doing recruiting-wise, Memphis is in the best position they've ever been. But I'm hearing the same things you're hearing, that there's probably going to be, at least from everything I read, um, the Big 12 wanting to, once they get the four, and again, the timing's all messed up because we don't know if Oklahoma and Texas are truly going to stay five yeah. years more or whatever. We, we, we probably believe that they're going to leave early. But let's just say it goes by what's contractually obligated right now for these schools. Texas and Oklahoma would be there through 25. The three American teams would get there in 24. BYU would get there in 23. So the 24 season 
would conceivably have 14 teams. The talk is that they would want to stay at that number. They would drop to 12 when Texas and Oklahoma leave. I don't know why they say 14 is better from a television contract, but that's what I'm reading. I'm sure you're reading the same things. If that's the case, I think Memphis is in position, but I'm tired of getting the hopes up every time just to get them dashed. I got the fingers crossed, but I'm not, uh, I'm not feeling that great about it. Understand. Understand. Greg, appreciate the, uh, the insight. Look forward to uh, checking you out on Saturday. Big one with Memphis and Mississippi State from the Liberty Bowl. Great visiting with you, Greg.